getting the word this morning. Amen. Yeah, it's something that he said about being where the presence of the Lord is. Not saying he's not with them, but it's something about when you gather together in a group of people that know what you've been going through all week. You know, he didn't tell us just to gather together for the sake of us uh, coming together to look strong. You know, here you have safety. You have a multitude of counselors. You have people who are praying on your behalf. You have people that know what it is to go out into the world and try to live this Christian life. It's the same kind of frustrations you got. With the same kind of personal battles that you got. With the same uh, pressures from the outside world that you partake in. And so when we come together, it's for the betterment of the body, for the healing of the body, for, for us to, to build one another up and to strengthen one another. And in doing so, the Lord promised to make his presence be here with us. And so it's something to come together and then to feel the presence of God together where we can worship and praise him together as a family. And so as we continue to look at the book of First John, we're going to look at the passage in chapter 3, of verses 4 through 10. And I, I struggled a little bit with it because I wanted to make it simple. And, and you know, and kind of not, not, you know. But you know what? That, that's not what God gave me. So, that's not what gave me. so uh, let us read together our text, verses 4 through 10. Whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin, because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. My Father, my God, we thank you for this opportunity to dive into your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will put us on one accord with the movement of thy spirit. Allow him to reveal what needs to be revealed to us, O oh God, and then give us ears to hear, that we may proceed in a heart, O oh God, that can Take in and understand the word that you're giving us. Illuminate now this word to us, O oh God, that we may see how to apply it to our lives, O oh God. Let there be no gap between your will and our communication of it. However you choose to bring forth thy word and to make it clear unto us. Let your word come forth with boldness, power, clarity, and authority from on high. Holy Spirit, facilitate this service. Facilitate this message that your people may be edified, that you, O oh God, may be exalted, and that the lost may be evangelized. We love you, God, and we want to honor you more than with our words. We want to honor you with our living. You sing your son in Jesus' name. We praise and thank you. Amen. Amen. Man, that struggle was real. I went over to Sister Carol. I said, you know what? I'm going to break this thing down to three small points, and then we're going to run out of here. I'm going to drop it like it's hot. And he said, no. Nah. Now you mess around and drop it, and then you have some questions later. So you know, who, who knows whether we'll get this opportunity again? So, so we gonna hold it like it's hot and it to you. But then we gonna take our time and dig around in there and see what God has to say to us as a body and as individuals. John here is dealing with the problem of sin in the life of a believer. Now we may have this. Understand. You know, I think we, we're kind of misguided when it comes to the believer in sin because uh, we, we understand that our salvation is secure. Okay, We won't lose our salvation. But how do we balance that with the recognition of sin in our lives and, and how we treat it? It, it? Does it matter that we sin if God is still going to save us? Doesn't matter how much we sin. Doesn't matter if it's willful sin or if it's uh, you know something that comes upon us and and we're unable to handle it. How does God view those things? Well, the word says and the standard is, "Be ye holy as I am 
holy. And so God makes no forms about his holiness. Right? He, he will not stand in the presence of sin. Right? And then it kind of leaves us a little disheartened there, right? Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. How do I reconcile being perfect and holy with the fact that I fall sometimes? With the fact that I don't always choose God's way? With the fact that sometimes in me I desire to do opposite of exactly what God has commanded me to do? Because that's a reality in the life of the believer. You'll have compulsions that will tempt you to sin. But we read that sin has been done away with. And that sin doesn't have any power over the believer. How do we reconcile these things? Because I don't know about you, but when I look at my life, it's easy. It's easy to find missteps, miscues. And, and, and then, you know, every day I'm confronted with, with, with things. Do, do I do this the way God says do it? Or, or do I do it the way I know how to handle it, or I think I know how to handle it. What's most important to me? Is my, my way more important to me, or is God's way more important to me? But the easy answer is, oh, yeah, God's way is more important. But then you find yourself in the position like Paul did. Every time you try to meet that commandment, every time you try to execute, you know, to live the life that God's calling us to live. But it's because we put the pressure and onus on ourselves to try to do something that God promised us he would do. But there is also the reconciliation of what's my role in the, uh, in the battle against sin? What's my part? What's the part that I play? And so, you know, it's easy to, to, to try to overlook sin and to try to mask it and act like it doesn't exist. But we find out that the more we mask it, the more it festers. And the more it festers, the, the stronger it seems to become. And then it actually gets to a point where it just kind of busts out when you don't want it to. It's like a little kid that you don't train at home, right? And you take him out in the streets, and all of a sudden, you want to tell this child, you know, you, you need to behave yourself out here. Act like you got some marriage. And the kid's looking at you like, act like you taught me. <laughs> They'll be good for a little while. And then right when you get to the, the focal point, you, know, you curse at home, and your first child, curse word probably end up being somewhere you really use. Right. And, and so sin has a way of disturbing us and rearing up his head at the most pivotal moments in our lives where we don't need it to show up. And it don't just show up, it shows out. We lose all control. You know in church for being uh, very temperate and sober very, you know, moderate and, you know, seems like nothing can face you. And then one day somebody steps on the wrong toe or hits the wrong nerve and you just lose it and you can't contain yourself. That's how sin operates. Well, John is writing to believers because he wants us to know that sin is very important to God. I mean, when, when he penned these words, he said that uh, if you are a child of God, then you don't commit sin. And we're sitting here like, are you kidding me? If you're a child of God, you don't commit sin? <clears throat> now I'm back to that whole thing where I'm questioning, you know, whether or not it is I'm saved. And it puts me in a position where now I'm starting to look like I have to work for my salvation again. Well, what is it that I got to do to earn it? Then he says that if you abide in him and his word abides in you, then you cannot sin. It's an impossibility. How can those things be reconciled? The, the reality is you are a believer. As a believer, you are saved. Your, your, your salvation is secure. You're not going to hell if you're a true believer. But what he wants us to understand is don't deceive yourself into believing that you're something that you're not. Amen. And so more, more than what you know, you know, we, we like to look at, you know, doctrine. I, you know, I, I know what the word says, and I'm going to 
because the word says this, you know, that, and rightfully so, that settles it for me. Yeah. But we can't get too comfortable into believing that we have no part to play in this thing. Uh, and, and so he, he says that it's an impossibility for you to sin yeah. if you're abiding in the word. Let's reconcile that. I'm a believer, but I sin. Every tense in this particular passage of scripture for the verbs when it talks about sin, it's in the present tense. And that means it's an ongoing action. And he said, and, and so he's not saying that as a believer, you're not going to sin. What he's saying is that believers don't practice sin. And as a matter of fact, he ties it up in that 10th verse. He says, in this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Manifest means uh, being known. How do you know if you're a child of God or a child of the devil. Uh -huh. He says, in this you'll know. He says that he that practices sin is of the devil. Yes. Yes. But he that does righteousness is of God. Yes. He that practices sin, willful, choosing sin, yes. should really check his salvation. Yes. Right. You, you really need to check and see if you are born again if the Spirit of God does dwell in you. Because if you can taste the goodness of a relationship with God, which is what he talked about in the first two chapters, making sure we knew we had a relationship with God. If you could ever get that close to see how good God is, then there's no way you can choose sin over God. And so you won't practice sin willfully, not to mean you won't fall, but you don't choose sin over choosing God. Your desire to please God and to be in fellowship with God should be stronger than that desire to please yourself. And that's not something that we get to overnight. That's something that we grow into. A, a key term, he says, that if you abide in me, and we talked about what that word abiding means, to remain in him to be steadfast in him, to be constantly choosing him. And so what that tells us is that at every moment there's an opportunity for me to follow God or to follow the enemy or to do my own thing because there's more than just the devil that's the enemy in the world. You have sin, you got the devil, but then you got self. So you got three very formidable foes who all have their power in sin. Sin, Satan and suffer. Because the flesh will tempt you. Lay here a little longer. As if you ain't got nothing to do. Or, or you know, or, or just like a toddler. You know, we, we, we throw tantrums in our own way. You know, if, if you don't do what I want you to do, then I, I'll withhold my smile from you. I don't have to talk to you today. I, I see you, but I don't have to acknowledge you. Hey, the games people play. Yeah. We're, we're not so unfamiliar that we think that that that, that we're beyond uh, a normal people problems. Because guess what? We're normal people. <laughs> Everyday people. And we, we struggle as believers with sin just like everybody else does. Right. Except when we begin to look at our lives in the light of God's word versus how we live. And then we find out that his way yields a certain fruit, but the other way yields a different fruit. And so in that 10th verse, he makes it pivotal, and he makes, it, makes us understand that uh, uh, rather than just, just uh, choosing or mentally accepting the precepts and promises of God, you have to make the rubber meet the road. you got to move from doctrine to duty. There's a point where you're going to have to act out in your life what it means to be a believer in Christ. And so he makes this contrast between the children of God and the children of devil. We'll look at both sides here. We'll look at what it means to be a child of God and what it means to be a child of the devil, and you'll see a lot of different characteristics. There's, they, they both have conclusive purposes. The end result of what they're looking for is different. Competing priorities, they're not the same. In other words, people of God don't operate like people of the world. 
You, you and your saved friends shouldn't look the same as you and your unsaved friends. Your, your practices now that you're a believer shouldn't be the same as when you were an unbeliever or before you got saved. You'll find that the practices are consistent but on different levels. You know, One's going to hold true to one way, one's going to hold true to a different way. And then you're going to see that your nature is compatible with either one or the other. Either you're a child of God or if you're a child of the devil. Let's contrast these purposes or these characteristics. What does the word say about the children of the devil? Their purpose is, first of all, verse 7, to deceive you, to lead you astray, to make you believe something is true when it's not true, or to make you believe something is not true when it is true. In other words, your relationship with God, he wants to make you think that either your relationship is better than it is or it's worse than what it is. What's the difference? If you believe that your relationship with God is better than it truly is, then you begin to put on a form of arrogance. You, you begin to build up a false confidence and a false sense of security that you're better and you have a handle on things that you really don't have a handle on. Case in point, I will never do that. We're quick to say that I'll never do that. And then the next thing you know, you know a month or two, Maybe a year, maybe five years, but down the line, you're stuck in that very thing that you thought you could never partake in. It, it's that real. I, 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 I thought I could never fall to this. But the reality is you can fall at any point at any time. You may be strong in your faith right now, but there may come a time when the fire is turned up enough to make you doubt. And, and don't get it twisted. Believers doubt. Yes. We, we doubt every now and then. Yes. You know, when, when, when trouble is up to here, yeah. uh, and, and you can't hardly breathe, mm -hmm. you, you begin to, to wonder. No, not God. no, he's still there. He's still there. But that's what the enemy wants you to think. And so he pumps us up with confidence, and then he watches us fall. See, if God doesn't elevate you to a point, if God gives you certain assurances, you can stand on those assurances. Right. But when those assurances aren't founded in his word or based on the word of God, then it leaves you an opportunity to fall. Yes. And that's what the enemy wants you to do. Yes. But now if you're underconfident in your salvation, then everything that goes on in your life, you view it from a different standpoint. Right. You, you view it from a different perspective. Uh, when, when, when a little bit of something happens, you use that as an opportunity to say that, uh, yeah, I, I know I need to get better. And, and you ever hear people that do that all the time? And uh, yeah, I know it was probably my fault. They got that pessimistic type of attitude that, that everything is against them. The world is falling down on them. And, and, and woe is me. I, I might not make it. And, and so I got to, you know, I, I got to do better. And I got to get there's nothing you can do to get more of God. You can pray all you want. He's not going to give himself more to you than he does to anybody else. The difference is, are you allowing him to have his way in your life? That's the difference. If you're allowing him to have his God's way versus your way, then it's, your life is going to reflect that. It's going to be a reflection of what you choose in that moment. And so if I choose God, then God's going to empower the situation in my favor. Yes. Now, we, when I say in my favor, it doesn't mean to, for me to have my desire. Don't get it twisted, because we have desires that aren't like God. Amen. And a lot of times, we want God to do things for us that he never promised us he was going to do. Or to put us in positions that he never promised us we would have. And so a lot of times we're looking after, that's what uh, the, the apostle calls praying amiss. You're praying for something and you're desiring something that's not in God's will for you. And, and, and because you're a believer, you think that, that that thing should be true for you because that's what you desire and you're so called on the God side. But God has a will and a purpose for your life that may not include all of the things that you desire. And so sometimes we have to reconcile those things and say, I have to choose what God gives me. What if God 
lets me live in a life of poverty. If that's that, that's his purpose for my life, to be a part of it. Not that, that, that I would live in poverty in the sense that I'm defeated by God, not, not, not like that, like I'm just flat broke all the time, but maybe I got many resources. Because right, you, may, maybe the reality is I'm not good with how I handle my resources. And, and the more God gives me, the more I'll mess up. And so he, he allows me to stay in a certain existence. Or maybe it's just for his will. Paul said, I, I, I had a thorn in my flesh that I besought the Lord three times. It, it was an ailment. Maybe you're sick and you want to be made well. And maybe it's not his will for you to be well. Can you live with that fact? Can, can you live with the fact that God has chosen this station for your life to be? Or maybe he's given you a lot. And you got the headache of always trying to figure out what you're going to do with all the But you have to find out what's true for you. Everybody ain't going to be rich. Everybody ain't going to be well. Everybody ain't going to be healed. Everybody ain't going to be liked. And so if those are the things that we're seeking from God, we might as well just stop that right now. That's not what he promised us. But he promised us that he would take care of all of our needs. Right? He promised to give us peace. And he said that that peace will pass our, will surpass our understanding. And so our understanding of happiness may be a massive stuff. But he makes sure you that, I don't know about you, but you know what, when we were younger and poorer and we just had each other, family seemed to look a little different. We got wrong a little bit. But when you start accumulating stuff and, and then you get busy and now you're important, you ain't got time to even see people that matter to you no more. And so now your relationships are strained and you're looking for how you can uh, uh, get your relationships back in order, but you ain't got time to spend with each other. It's little things like that that we have to reconcile. What's God's will versus what's my will? What's his desire versus what's my desire? And so Paul tells us that, that, that whatsoever state that we find ourselves in, be content where you are. Let, let God decide if he's going to move you to the left or move you to the right. If he wants you to be richer or poor, if he wants you to be happier or healthier, let him decide that. Our responsibility is to be pleasing to him, turn over our way to him. And let him guide and dictate. The problems come when we put our hands on everything. And so this, with this area of sin, he's saying that I have rule over sin for you. I defeated sin. It's conquered, right? And sin doesn't have power over you anymore. If you sin, it's because you have opened the door and you have chosen sin. How do I know that? He says, don't lend your body as instruments of unrighteousness. In other words, you don't have to practice sin. You don't have to sin habitually. There's something to forsake, and there's something to pursue. You are forsaking sin, and you are choosing righteousness, which means that you must find out what God views as righteous so that you know what to follow. But if you don't know what God chooses as righteous, then you continue to go on what I feel, how I think, what I think is right, what I think is just, what the world says is right, how I've been brought up. Those things matter to you more than the word of God. But now if you pursue God's righteousness, and that means I have to find out what is it that God likes? What is it that he desires of me? And those are the things that I'm going to focus on. Problem comes when we lose focus on what he wants for us and we begin to focus on what we want for us. And so in anytime we focus on anything other than his will for us, then we sin. Because we are automatically out of his will. Make no mistakes about it. There's only two ways. He says that you're going to manifest yourself as a child of God or you're going to manifest yourself as child of the devil, of the lawless one, the, the, the one who chooses other than God. And so there's no two ways about it. You, you can't choose them today and not choose them tomorrow. You have, to, you have to abide. That means remain. That means dwell. That means have your permanent residency in the word of God and operating in the word. And so as we look at these things, what, he says that the, the devil's purpose is to deceive you. It's to mess up your relationship with God. You'll be consistent 
those who are of the devil in practicing sin. In other words, if you were to put a timeline of your life on the board moment by moment, more times than not, you will actively choose sin over God. You will choose self over God. You'll choose the world over God. What does that look like? What does choosing self over God look like? Well, there's some things I want in life. And if I'm willing to do anything to get them, then I'm choosing self over God. If I let my body dictate to me how I'm going to live this life, I'm choosing self over God. How do you choose the world over God? Well, the world has its own ideas and pressures and the way it operates. If I choose to operate like the world, then I'm choosing the world over God. If I choose created things, even the things that God created, over the word of God, then I'm choosing the world over God. Now, to choose the enemy over God simply means that I just disregard guard God altogether. And so the difference is the child of the devil, the devil practices sin. He continually sins. He habitually sins. It's his norm. It's not out of the ordinary for him to choose anything else other than God. And it's reflected in his nature. The word says he has not seen him does not know him. Because when, when you begin to get closer to God and you develop a relationship with God, certain things become true of your life. You, you see what's real in him, and then you see how everything else fails in comparison. Now, if you can see God and still choose everything else that is failing, then it's a good indicator that you're pretty blind. Or you're lost. You don't know what good looks like. And so you're already lost, and you're, you're, you're sold out for the enemy. And so they, your nature is of the devil. And the word says he sins from the beginning. He's the original sinner. He chose self over God. Right? And so anything we choose other than God shows us that we're in error, in sin. And so this is their norm. This is their practice. They're of the devil. In other words, they have not been born again. They do not come from God. And so even though they may be in the church, they may have come down and taken the seat just like you did. They may have even made a great grand confession that, that I, I know that Jesus is the Son of God, blah, 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 blah. And yet, your life doesn't reflect the righteousness of God, and it's an indicator that you may still be of the devil. That that... Uh, that that change has not yet taken place in you. So it's not a change that you have to sit around and tear me for and wait for. The Holy Spirit, once he makes himself a part of your life, he begins right away to go to work. Yes. And so how do you recognize the children of God? Their purpose is easy. Verse 5 says that they was manifested to take away our sins. Jesus said in um, chapter Luke, he said that uh, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. In other words, God wants to give you direction for your life. Direction that leads to relationship with him. If, you're, if the direction you're going to doesn't lead you into a better relationship with God, you might want to change directions. If the direction you're heading to isn't lined up with the precepts of God, then you need a new direction. Because he says sin is the transgression of the law. It's the, it's the choosing of sin over, the, over God's law. It, it's sinning versus choosing righteousness. But the child of God looks for opportunity to do away with sin as Christ came to take away sins from us. He, the, Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. Now, what is the work of the devil? We saw it. Part of it was to deceive you, but ultimately it's to destroy you. Yes. The devil's got a playbook with three plays: steal, kill, and destroy. Man, he, that's, that's all he's trying to do. He wants to steal the joy that God has given you. He wants to take away from uh, how God is embellishing your life. He wants to take life from you. We understand what kill and destroy means, but we're, we're talking about 
and utter destruction. We're talking about he doesn't want to leave you nothing. And you know how, you know, in the movies, they, they'll take everything away and they'll leave you, and you can have this, so you can remember. No, he don't want you to have nothing. He's trying to kill you off, and he's not playing. The devil is real, and, and, and his antics are real. Yes. The results of his antics are real. And, 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 and God has given Christ the, the opportunity. Christ has come to destroy the work of the devil. Everything that he's trying to take away from you, God is trying to give you. He says, all things are yours because they belong to him. And we're his children. If we're his children and he possesses all things, just like an earthly child inherits what his father has, we have access to everything that our father has. Now, doesn't mean that we get everything. Because just like a good parent knows how to withhold some things from a child, that's what God does. He withholds those things from us that will damage us, that will hurt us, that will lead us astray. And so he's come to destroy the works of the devil. Our priority as children of God are, is to abide in God. And that means to be more intimate in our relationship and fellowship with him. It's to be more pleasing to God rather than looking at ourselves or looking at things. We look at God first. He has preeminence in our life. And preeminence means that we choose him above everything else. That means that he has first place. Everything else comes after that. And so even when it comes to choosing our jobs, choosing other, what, what is God's plan and will for my life? Okay, so I have this job, but what we say, what we tend to do is we say, you know what? I'm a Republican. And I'm a Christian. Or I'm black. And I'm a Christian. And we celebrate our being black and give it more credence than we do being a Christian. Now, being black is just a part of who you are. Being Christian should dictate who you are. And so when it comes to you choosing your race or the word of God, it should be the word of God. Because God's word dictates over all races. Yes. He created men. We didn't create ourselves. And so there's no superiority in race. There's no superiority in status. You may have more. But in God's eyes, you may be less. Just because we possess things, it doesn't give us power. It doesn't give us any special place with God. It's an understanding that God has the preeminence. He has the power over all of it. It all belongs to him. And because it all belongs to him, then I have to treat it as such. And so I'm an African-American, but I'm a Christian. And so do I let the ills of, or, or the power of being an African-American overtake me being a Christian? No, I, I, I'm a Christian first. And I utilize uh, my, my, the principles that I learned to live by as a Christian over the fact that I'm an African-American. It supersedes that. And so it dictates how I'm going to live rather than how the world dictates how I, as an African-American, will live. They may view me as a second-class uh, second citizen. But I'm a child of God right. first. Yes, yes. Oh, and so there are certain things that are true of me as a child of God yes. that uh, just because I'm African American, I may not see celebrating my blackness. Oh, right. I have to choose that over my station. I choose God over the fact that I'm a supervisor at work. Oh, right. Because some of us, when we get to work, we think that oh, this is a separation there. This ain't church. Okay. And so I got a job to do. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? There's a way that God wants his people to behave and to, to carry themselves. And even being a supervisor, you can do your job by the principles of the word of God and come out better than trying to do your job the way you know how to do it. He says that the world views uh, leadership as lording it over people, taking charge, making people do what you want them to do. But, but, but the child of God serves. And so you must understand that your leadership is an opportunity to serve. In other words, I'm here to make sure you have everything that you need to be successful at your job. I'm not here to dictate to you how to do your job. I'm here to make sure you're successful at doing your job. There's a big difference. Or you can say, hey, look, this is what needs to be done. Let's figure out the best way to do it. What do you need to, to get from A to B? Let me figure out how I can help you to be the best that you are in your position. 
there's a difference. And people respond to it differently. And so we have the responsibility to be Christian before anything else. Right? And so our practices, we don't choose. We don't, we don't get to pick and choose uh, who, you know, gets preferential treatment. You know, I, I, I don't uh, act in unright. I don't act unrighteously. I act righteously. In other words, God's word dictates my behavior, my attitudes. You know, just because I feel bad doesn't mean I have a right to treat you bad. Uh, because I didn't have my coffee this morning, you know, I don't get to shun you. You know, when you come and you speak to me, because I ain't had my coffee yet, you know how I am. Yeah. It ain't about how you are. That's part of the problem. How you are is part of the problem. How you need to be is a person who's governed by the principles of God, which means that no matter how I feel, this is what governs my life. This is how I act. This is how I respond to things. And so we, we, we respond righteously. We respond differently than the world responds. That's what God was looking for. He's looking for proof that we are his children, not that we're trying to prove that we are his children, but it should already be a natural part of who we are. It's part of our nature. In him, in Christ, was no sin, so in us should be no sin. Christ is righteous, therefore, we should be righteous. We are born of God. In other words, we're of the same essence as he is. Now, that may not have been true before, because as an unbeliever, I didn't have the life of God in me. I didn't have the power to, 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 to navigate this life in a righteous manner. I was sold in sin. I was a slave to sin. In other words, sin dictated everything that I did. But because I am now a child of God, and his life lives in me and resides in me, I am, I am going to abide in him like he abides in me. I'm going to allow him to dictate my actions, to dictate my attitudes, to dictate how I look at life, and that's going to make a difference in my life. That's how people are going to know that there's a difference in me. Yes. It's not so much because I have the power to make a difference, but he who resides in me has all power. Yes. And because he has all power, whatever is in me that is not like him, he can overcome it. And so he lets us know that we are already overcomers. His seed remains in us. It'll be a part of us. As a matter of fact, it's going to be more than a part of you. It's going to transform you. If the seed of God is in you, just like a plant grows up, he's growing. And, and the new man is being made stronger every day. And the old man is being made weaker. In other words, the more we choose God, the more powerful and prevalent God becomes in our lives and we can see him in action. You can't see him in action choosing other than him. And so abiding in him means that I, I'm going to get in his word. I'm going to get in my time in prayer. I'm going to heed the word of God, and I'm going to give it priority in my life. And in giving it priority, then I will see the power yielded in my life where it makes a difference. A lot of times we're looking for the power to manifest itself without allowing God to show himself first. The first thing he told his disciples is, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Why, why, why learn of him? Because if we're going to be as he is, then we have to know how he is. If you've never taken an opportunity to get close and to get to know him, then how is it you call yourself in shock? It's, 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 it's an impossibility, which means sin is going to dominate your life. And he says it's impossible to be a child of God and for sin to dominate your life. It just doesn't work. And so if there's struggles with sin in your life, then we have to figure out why there's a struggle. Because the, the word has already told us that he's already overcome. He's overcome. And because he's overcome, we've overcome. And we're in him. If we're in him, we've overcome. We don't have to practice sin. And so then we have to look for those opportunities to eradicate sin or allow him to eradicate sin. Now, what he's doing is day by day, he's showing us different things in our lives. And if we're paying attention, he's showing you this is what you need to work on. Here's an area that's a source spot. Did you 
you see how that relationship is playing out? Learn from that. You don't always have to go and speak something about it. You can be looking at things, and he, he can show you how you should operate by what you're looking at, by the things that come across your life. And so it's, it's no uh, mistake that you're in the position that you're in or you are where you are. God knows exactly where you are, and he promises to use every means, everything that you encounter to, to, to help to grow you into the, the person or the stature of Christ so that we can be like he is. The standard is to be perfect, and he will make us perfect as we learn to abide in him, as we choose him, as we pick God over everything else. You'll see his power begin to manifest, and you'll see how your attitude will change. You'll see how your desires will change. Your wants are going to change. And so your, the way you operate is going to change. Yes, That's how people will know you're a child of God. And so you won't have to work, walk around, you know, with your spiritual t-shirts on and say, you know, God first and all that kind of stuff. And what would Jesus do, bracelets? And you know, make sure you got your Bible under your arm and a cross on your neck and all that. Kind of, all that's outward showy stuff. All right. He wants people to know you by the genuine person that you are, the genuine person that he's changing you into on the inside. And it's not going to come because you say, hey, I'm different. It's going to come because they're going to look at your life, and your life is going to reflect the difference. It's going to reflect the godly attitude. It's going to reflect the humility. It's going to reflect the regalness that comes along with being a child of God. And so we are in we are unable to continue and practice sin. The believer cannot practice sin because sin is incompatible with the law of God. The two don't go together. He says sin is the transgression of the law, verse 4. In other words, this uh, lawlessness is not keeping it. And verse 7 says that, that uh, if we are righteous, then righteousness will be the fruit of who we are. Sin is incompatible with the work of Christ. Verse 5 says that he was manifested to take away our sins because in him is no sin. And what was his work? To destroy the works of the devil. Verse 8. Sin is incompatible with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's the one that gives us access to God. Right? And because he gives us access to God, now we're able to do what we could not do before. We can pursue and perform righteously. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what we allow him to do in us. And so this is how uh, God deals with sin in our believer, in the life of the believer. Sin is important. It's of the utmost importance. And every day, every moment, we have an opportunity to either choose God or to choose sin. If you're a child of God, then you'll be pursuing God. You'll flee everything else. It won't have as much importance, but you will follow after and pursue God. You'll want to get to know him. You'll want to get to know how God feels about certain things. And, and so when, when the media talks about these things in the news and you, you're sitting there and you're conflicted on how you feel about certain things, because uh, the, some of these problems are close to us in our lives, and, and we love an individual uh, that, that, that is wayward or whatever, but how do we treat those things? Well, how does God say you treat them? How do we view one another? Do we get to look down on each other? No. We view each other the way God views us. We view ourselves the way God views us. And so sin is that important. It's our responsibility to forsake sin. Now, to forsake sin means that I don't give it power. How do I not give it power? I don't give it attention. And so when it rears its head up, I don't pay attention to it. If I'm forsaking it, then it's just like walking in a room and not acknowledging somebody. I'm going to forsake you. And I'm not enlightened. You don't exist. But if I don't have something that I'm pursuing, the idea is that sin is going to overtake me. And so I can't stop pursuing righteousness. The moment I stop pursuing righteousness, Sin gains a grip. And so we have a responsibility as believers to abide in the word. And that means that day and night, moment by moment, we must be looking at the word of God. We must be looking 
at the person of God, looking at the character of God. And, and that's why Bible study is so important. That's why prayer is so important. That's why being around each other is so important because we, we lift each other up. We help each other to, to, to see God more fully. We help each other in our struggles. We minister to each other's needs so that we're not tempted to sin. Yes. Our responsibility is to forsake sin and pursue God yes. with everything that we've got. Yes. Pursue him in my job, yes. just like I do in my personal life. Yes. I pursue him in my relationships, just like I do. I pursue him in, 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 in everything that I do. So there's nothing that I can do that I can't take God's word into account for. If I do that, then I'll fall into sin. Amen? Amen. All right, that's our word. That was long. Y'all forgive me. <laughs>